Hi, I'm Jody and this is Geeking Jody channel. I want to talk about the Shim bug which is recently found with lots of news. It's an important bug. It's a remote code execution on every single Linux bootloader which is using Shim. I think it's 100% of the Linux distros. So, here I want to show you what the bug is. Then we will check the Shim's code to understand on the deepest level about the bug. I'm trying to show you how to read source codes, how to understand more deeply about programming, see how Red Hat is writing the bootloader, and by checking the source code itself, not the second-hand news. The whole thing started uh, much longer in 2023, I wanted to say much longer ago, some long time ago or something. English is not my first language, as you can guess. Uh, but this tweet from Bill Demir Kapi, maybe a Turkish guy, just a guess from the sound of the family name. Uh, I think he's from Microsoft. And he said, found my first UEFI vulnerability signed bootloader. Wow. Vulnerability? on the UEFI. As you know already, hopefully, otherwise I have some videos about this in more depth. UEFI is the system that modern computers boot themselves on a hardware, hardware, hardware level. We used to have BIOS, now we have the unified system, UEFI. This is the background of the story. The, po the point is, and the problem maybe is, in Linux world, we consider this as a huge problem. Still, we don't like it. In some place, hardware vendors, we believe, with a push from operating system vendors, decided to move from BIOS to UEFI. On a UEFI level, it's a secure boot. You need to know what is booting your hardware because you should be safe. People were worried about that this will prevent people from installing Linux on their hardware. Because whatever new PC you may buy, a laptop, PC, desktop, whatever, it will have UEFI. Okay, in one game, we are able to disable secure boot on UEFI. But what happens if not? Every single operating system which boots the computer should be signed by one of the operating system vendors, and it means Microsoft. Very, very few others. What Linux World did? They created a project by Red Hat. They created a project called Shim, and this Shim gets a certificate from Microsoft and signs itself. Signed by a certificate from Microsoft. Now Shim can boot the computer. Shim is a very, very, very small uh, bootloader. Shim is signed now, so it can boot an UEFI machine. Then it hands over to good old Grub. Now it's Grub 2. Grub is the main bootloader in the Linux world. So we have Shim signed by Microsoft, supported by Red Hat. So it's the, your hardware, UEFI Secure Boot, will see Shim as a signed, and it is signed, a valid operating system. Shim does a very, very minor first step in booting, then hands over everything to Grub. Grub will go and do the actual boot, your actual boot, in most cases is loading the Linux kernel, VR, whatever virtual memory for the beginning you need and everything like VM, Linux and everything. So uh, I have a video, I will link it here and you can see how it works. This is why we have Shim. But Bill have found a critical flaw in Shim. CVE 2023, 40547. It says 
remote code execution vulnerability was found in Shim. The Shim boot supports trust. The Shim boot support trusts. The Shim boot support trust attacker control values when parsing an HTTP response. We can have HTTP boots here. Normally, when I buy a computer, I insert a new hard drive in it, or I buy a laptop, I erase the windows, and I need to install my operating system. What should I do? I will connect a CD using a USB, or if it has a CD drive, I will insert a CD, or I will connect a USB flash to it, which has a bootable Linux, or whatever. I need physical access. This is hard. Especially if you have a server room with 1000 Linux machines where you want to install Linux or you have a new virtual machine and you want to install something. We used to have a protocol called PXE. This was a method to install an operating system on a machine remotely using networks. Now this is obsolete and we have HTTP boot which is supported by Shim. You have a computer here. It's new. You set up a server in your data center. You have your DNS, so this has a name. You have an HTTP server on it, so it can serve files. And you have an DHCP server to assign IP addresses. This computer boots up. The hardware is uh, supporting the boot, so it requests for DHCP. When it has an IP, it checks for this server and downloads using HTTP all the files which are required for booting the hardware. The good news is now if you have a server room with thousands of new servers, you can just set up this, turn this on, they will find it, will download the requested files, needed files, sorry, and will boot the machine. Remotely, you can do all your work. But what is the problem in this very severe remote code execution bug? This says, uh, Shim boot support trusts attacker control values when parsing a HTTP response. The attacker can craft a specific malicious HTTP request leading to completely controlled out of bounds right. Hmm. This is what always happens with C programs. That is one of the reasons that Rice is arising. The point is, uh, you have a memory. This is what exactly happening in this attack. You have a computer which boots with Shim. Normally, you have a server, you request something. It says, okay, I'm sending you the boot files. The length is one megabyte. Please download. You say, okay, I'm Shim, I'm downloading. Okay, you said the length is one megabyte. I will create a buffer with the length of one megabyte. Now, please send me the data. Okay, okay, this is the content. And the server sends you one megabyte of data. You will write one megabyte of data here, then save it to disk, boot it, whatever you want to do. It works fine. But what the attacker do? The attacker lies to you. You are Shim. This is the server. You say, okay, I want to boot myself. Says, okay, I'm sending you only 40 kilobytes. Shim says, okay. The header says 40 kilobytes. So I created a 40 kilobyte memory buffer. Then the attacker sends you two megabytes of data. What happens? You say, okay, I'm saving it in this buffer. Two megabytes is saved. Now you are writing data where you should not. This is what happens a lot in C programming because it's not memory safe. What happens is you have a computer, there are things in your memory, and your program says, okay, I need 40 kilobytes because the header says 40 kilobytes. Operating system says, Shim says, okay, C says, okay, a 40 kilobyte buffer is here, this is yours. And you start writing whatever is you are reading 
in this and it's more than 40. So you're overwriting other places. If you execute it here, you are executing whatever attacker crafted for you. This is out of bound rights. Let's check the source code. If you are more interested, you can check the http.dev, very nice site about HTTP. You can see different things there. You can go, for example, see the headers. You have a content length header here, which you can check. Also on the github.com slash redhatboot slash shim. You can find the shim project here. I've already cloned it and you have it here, what I did. These days I'm trying to use mainly the VS Code to look normal, but in this case, NVIM, NeoVim, configured with lazy git is much, much more capable. Why? Because you can go say, okay, I want the git. Lazy git is very, very useful. You can say four, it goes here. All the recent logs, we can search for this uh, pattern. So I will search for, sorry, here. I will search for that. This is the commit by Peter Jones from Red Hat. Fix this. Says, okay, this CV, avoid incorrectly trusting HTTP headers. When retrieving files via HTTP or related protocols, Shim attempts to allocate a buffer to store the received data, what I described. Unfortunately, this means getting the size from an HTTP header. Because on the HTTP, when you connect, you send some headers and then you some send the data. This header can lie. You can say my content length is 40, but then send two megabytes of data. Shim creates a buffer of 40 and then writes whatever data you send in it. So overwriting other parts of the memory which can be manipulated to specify a size that's smaller than the received data. Cool. Let's check what the patch is. If you click on it, it says, okay, previously I had only this one line. I was checking, I was checking this and says, okay, P error fail to get content if the buffer size is zero. Now this is added. I check if buffer size is smaller than the body length. Let's go to the code and see it there. This was the HTTP boot dot C. So here I will do HTTP boot dot C. This is the code we are speaking about. If I go up, you will see that I'm in receive HTTP response. It receives the response. It gets the response. Initially, the Rx message and buffer initializes. Says, okay, this is my body length is size of the buffer. This is. And data response, whatever. We go down here, notify the firmware to receive the HTTP message. Okay. Wait for the response. I'm ready to read the response. It says HTTP poll for the HTTP. Then uh, check for the status code. Let me scroll a little bit further. Then check the status code. If the data you read, if HTTP status is not equal and HTTP status equals the message data response HTTP status. You know, we have different statuses for HTTP and it's very fun. There is a site, for example, with HTTP status dogs. There is also one for cats if you prefer cats. HTTP status says what is happening. In general, 200 family means it's okay. When you get 404, it's not found. When you get 500 family, it means a problem on the server side. Server has an issue. All these dogs do have issues. So 200 means standard response when successful HTTP request. So here, Shim checks if the response equals 200. If not, 
it gives an error and says, okay, read, I had an issue reading data. Go to error. Then check the length of the file. We had this in the previous rare version. It goes through all the headers, loops over the number of the headers, read the header, and if header, file name, content length, if it found it, creates a buffer, converts this ASCII to the bit and says, okay, this is my buffer. So reads the buffer, buffer size from content length. I need to create a buffer in memory to save the data here, right? What I'm doing is checking the header one by one. If I found the content length, I will move the number in my buffer size. So this will be my buffer size. I'm reading the buffer size from the headers. Here, the problem starts. This part. It says, if buffer size equals zero, and this was in the code initially, we had this check. See, this is in 2000. I do fun things, but I did a click and my fun things broke. This is for 2015. We had this. If you read the buffer size and buffer size was zero, create an error. Although in those times, it was not going to the error. Okay, buffer size is zero. I'm not doing anything. Now this is added with Peter Jones coming. But this is the main thing which is added recently. First, we check if the buffer size is zero, Okay, error with fail to, to get content length and go to error. But this is new, completely new. It says if your buffer size is smaller than Rx message body length, please uh, pay attention to this. We were reading the buffer size from the header content length. The system was claiming that the body length is this much. We read this. If this is smaller than the body length, this is very bad. Bad person is trying to write out of bounds. So if the buffer size you read from the headers is smaller than the actual body length, give an error, invalid content length, and go to error. This is the whole thing which prevents that one. What I want you to see is even Shim, which is the initial bootloader of your hardware, which provides access to the signed boot system and then hands over to Grub, is readable. Is in very, very normal, understandable, nice C. And it should be. Code should be readable. So be brave, read codes. Now you are reading what? an advanced engineer in Red Hat has done to prevent an attack to all the Linux servers in the world. You are stepping up. This was what I wanted to show you. Be brave, check these things, read the source codes. If you want, subscribe, check other uh, videos I have about adding commands to Veeam, checking why source code is moving to the, why Linux is moving to the new C, what previous C lagged and this kind of stuff. You can be a professional very, very easily. The point is in many normal works, cases, tests, videos, we don't see these things. And imagine that these are super strange and hard. Now you completely understand what this means. You completely understand what the attack was. And you completely to the last step understand how Red Hat engineer prevented this attack to all Linuxes. Hope you enjoyed. This was Jody, Geeking with Jody. If you enjoyed, please tell your friends. Will encourage me to create more videos. Have fun and subscribe and enjoy your life. Do whatever you want.